dann sind wir gehoriert, gehen wir in den Ausgang nach, die Dornkappe nicht auf Dauern an. Hello everyone, I'd like to say thank you once again for coming to listen to us today. Uh, let me begin, begin by paying respects uh, for those First Nations, Inuit and Métis from this land of the Mississaugas of Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. To the elders past and present and those yet to come, we pay our respects. To those courageous enough to cross the cultural abyss that exists in this country, we pay our respects. To those struggling to protect their lands and their rights, we pay our respects. To those who defended and continue to defend the lands and waters, and to those who gave their lives so that we may stand strong, we pay our respects. And to those who reclaim their languages and their traditional practices, and those who maintain the old songs and create new ones, we pay our respects. And finally, we pay our respects to those who use art as the voice of our time. So please welcome today, thank you for joining us. Please welcome Patricia Marokan Norby uh, to Wapata's fifth in conversation event as part of our Indigenizing the Art Museum virtual series. This is an, initi an initiative that was uh, an open dialogue with curators at the forefront of indigenizing museums and examining institutional collections and practices from around the world. The series is developed by our own Wapata team here at OCAD University as part of our global indigeneity outreach initiatives, which are, is led by Brittany Pitsilak Bergen, Natalia Chastapalova, and Mariah Magus. Miwasigi. We'd also like to thank Lisa Smith of the Onsite Gallery for continuing to support us, and in particular, the virtual platform for Indigenous Art. And finally, our appreciation goes out to the President Serrano of OCAD University for underwriting this series, as well as to the Canada Council who continue to support us in our endeavors. So Patricia Marokin Norby, is of the Pude Pucha ancestry, a Pueblo in the northwestern part of Mexico. Patricia was raised in Chicago. Uh, she currently is the uh, American, uh, oversees the American Wings Native American Art Collection at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And prior to coming to the Metropolitan Museum, she was the senior executive and assistant director at the National Museum of the American Indian, the New York branch. And prior to that, she was the director of the Darcy McNichol Center for American Indian and Indigenous Studies, which is part of the Newbury Library in Chicago. And her forthcoming book, Water, Bones, and Bombs, examines uh, the 20th century Native American art and an and environmental disputes in Northern New Mexico. And that's published by the University of Nebraska Press. More, and not long ago, she also edited, co-edited Aesthetic Violence, Art and Indigenous Ways of Knowing for the American Indian Culture and Research Journal. That was in 2015. Patricia earned her dissertation or PhD from the University of Minnesota, the Twin Cities. So welcome, Patricia. Thank you. Congratulations on being the first Indigenous curator at the renowned Metropolitan Museum of Art. You are kind of the Neil Armstrong, aren't you? I almost said Louis Armstrong. <laughs> That but Neil Armstrong, yeah. <laughs> you know, one yeah. small step for indigenous curation and one giant leap, you know, you get the drift. <laughs> I do, I do, step by step. 
Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. I also want to mention uh, quickly, just as a Purapacha woman with ancestral roots in the Southwest, that I am a guest here in Lenape Hoking, where the Met is situated. Well, thank you. Everybody, of course, knows the Met, the Metropolitan, or I'm sure everybody refers to it as the Met. We know it for several reasons. Uh, but one, and I've been there numerous occasions over the years, and I'm sure many of our folks in the listening audience has as well. But I have one story I remember many, many years ago. This was in the late 80s, and I was, like many people, you know, on the front steps, they're quite long steps, and you sit there. And I was sitting there just enjoying it, as is the crowd. There's usually, it's always crowded. And I was sitting there this one time, and beside me, well, not beside me, but a little, just a little ways away, was the renowned Inuit artist from Cape Dorset or Kingai by the name of Pudlo Pudlat. And I'm sure many of you know him. And of course, I believe it's probably, it was his first time in New York coming from Cape Dorset. You know, he was just looking at the crowd of people that were all down there, the buskers that are playing and I'm sure he was just taking it all in. And if you know his work, he, he deals and addresses in modernity and how modernity has affected and influenced the Arctic. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that time he was just taking it all in and inspired by all that was going on. So I'd like to do some research or maybe somebody out there has done some research around 1988, 89 to see if he actually responded to that experience of coming out of the north and into the, into the, into the south. Uh, and more recently, of course, at the Met, um, here in uh, the indigenous art world, and certainly in Canada, we've been following the installation of our beloved Kent Monkman, who's Mistagosuk. The wooden boat people was installed, this painting that was installed just not long ago. But I want to talk about that, so we'll get back to that a bit later. But for now, now that I have you, now that we have you for the next hour, Patricia, I would like to, know, first of all, know a little bit about your own curatorial trajectory, because you were once a student of a very good friend of mine, the late, great Truman Lowe. So let's start there, and perhaps you can tell us a little bit about this trajectory. Yeah, well, uh, Truman was my professor and my professional mentor while I was earning my MFA um, in printmaking and photography at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I grew up in the Midwest in Ho-Chunk territory and Truman was Ho-Chunk. And at UW-Madison, I was one of several indigenous students who worked with him. And the indigenous students just all gravitated to Truman. He was a wonderful, thoughtful teacher who gave us guidance, but also gave us a lot of room to grow creativity, creativity, uh, I'm almost saying creativity, but creatively, <laughs> and um, allowed us to gain our, our confidence and our own develop our own aesthetic approach. And some of the best advice he gave us was, don't be afraid to let the hardware show. And this is an approach I really appreciated and which he practiced in his own work. And I think we have a slide of, of one of his sculptures. Yeah, let's go to the first slide. Uh, so this is um, his feather canoe work from 1993. It's made from stripped willow, uh, white feathers and copper wire. And it has a lot of references to sky as well as water. Uh, Truman was an avid canoe, canoeer, and he spent a lot of time on the rivers in Wisconsin. Uh, much of his work references his, uh, the earth and effigy mounds that are throughout Wisconsin and uh, connected to the Ho-Chunk community. There, there are ancestral connections there, uh, but also the trees and the forests and, and the waterways. Um, Truman spent many years as a tour guide for the Wisconsin Dells uh, duck boat tours, which he shared with me when we worked together. And so his, his work references his community and also his, his homelands. So um, I love this work. It's very aesthetically, but also conceptually refined. 
And I'm very excited to say that it's now on its way to the Met as we speak. It'll be arriving soon and it'll be part of our 2022 Art of Native America rotation um, opening next, um, next February. That's, that's really, really good news. I'm, I'm sure his, his family will be really, really proud and so will the community of uh, Wisconsin where he spent so many, many years as well as the folks in Washington where he worked for a bit. But I wanted to talk uh, a bit more now about uh, your PhD studies, American studies at the University of Minnesota, where you developed, uh, I believe, your own visual art program, and which evolved into a very uh, a critical analysis of Southwestern art, and in particular, women's painting. Uh, and as you mentioned, and as I mentioned earlier, this new book that's coming out that's called Water, Bones, and Bombs, which of course I can't wait to get a copy of, but could you tell us a bit more about this really, really interesting program? And I'm assuming that the dissertation became part of this book. Yes, the book um, is directly from my dissertation work and my doctoral program at the University of Minnesota was uh, part of the American Studies Department. And I, so I was an American Studies scholar, but I also um, am very grounded in art history, also American Indian studies. So I honed my skills in critical thinking, aesthetics, also indigenous history, American Indian law and museum studies. So all of these topics combined into my book, Water, Bones and Bombs, which centers on 20th century American Indian and American art of the Northern Rio Grande Valley in New Mexico and its connections to environmental disputes. In my work, I examined um, the art of three artists, Tony de Pena from San Ildefonso and Cochiti Pueblos, Georgia O'Keeffe and Helen Hardin from Santa Clara Pueblo. Should, we, should we go to the next slide? I think yes. it's in the next yes. slide. Let's, let's advance to the next slide. So during the 20th century, all three artists worked and lived in no the Northern Rio Grande Valley and they had strong personal professional connections to the landscape and region. I examined Tonita Pena's watercolor paintings in context with land and water conflicts between Indian and non-Indian communities during the 1920s. I also examined the life and art of Helen Hardin and the intersections between nuclear weapons production and Pueblo Indian art. Hardin belonged to a generation of Pueblo and other New Mexican citizens who were unknowingly exposed to radiation and other pollution caused by unregulated toxic waste dumping at Los Alamos National Laboratory in the decades following World War II. So in context with this environmental destruction, I examined Hardin's studio techniques, which further exposed her body to hazardous materials. And then finally, I also look at the ancient Tewa Pueblo Abishu or Abiquiu, New Mexico, and local indigenous perspectives of the American artist, Georgia O'Keeffe, who you know, many of us are very familiar with her work, um, O'Keeffe occupied Abiquiu for over 50 years. I review her paintings in relation to forced livestock executions, land grant violations, and also land appropriations. So there's a strong legal context to my visual analysis. And I think we have another slide of O'Keeffe's, yeah. um, one of her well-known paintings. There we yeah, go. So this is part of her um, equine skull uh, series. And as you can see, and the, the image on the right is a um, actual equine skull that O'Keeffe collected and had in her home. And she painted this uh, equine skull numerous times. And then the image on the right or on the left is the um, one of her paintings, um, equine or mule skull with turkey feathers from um, the 1930s. Also, um, there was a large, um, execution of wild horses in Abiquiu in the 1930s. And this is one of the reasons why O'Keeffe had so, so much access to uh, different skulls from equine or um, different cows and other animals. And she was able to uh, keep them in her home and then paint them. She saw them as something beautiful, but the local people remember them as a visual reminder of the violence that they experienced in their communities. Mm. So um, 
I was going to yes. say too that um, my scho this scholarly work and my engagement with the indigenous communities um, has greatly impacted my curatorial vision. And so I would say, similar to my scholarly approach, there are three main threads in my curatorial practice, uh, foregrounding indigenous voices and perspectives, environmental justice, and then also my, my very strong commitment to indigenous sovereignty. Did you want to talk about that last part, particularly uh, in relation to uh, a ceremony that uh, is from your community? I believe you you were interested in that particular subject for this book. Yes. Um, yeah, well, there was a relevant experience that I had while I was working at the Newberry, uh, directing the Indigenous Studies Center there. If we could go to the next slide, that would next be- Next slide. Cool. Yeah. That's good. Well, Thank you. So this is um, actually a Kiche um, community ceremony that I was invited to participate in at the Newberry. Um, I was considered one of the caretakers of the Popol Vuh, which is a sacred 16th century text of the Kiche community from Guatemala. And the Popol Vuh contains uh, creation stories as well as other important cultural information. The Popol Vuh was translated during the 18th century into Spanish and now that text, which includes both the Quiche and Spanish translations side by side, is um, kept at the Newberry. And so as a caregiver of the sacred text, I was invited to receive a blessing from the Quiche community who would hold a ceremony every four years on the equinox. And during this particular ceremony, I was um, given um, a blessing and also a protection um, blessing, and I was also asked to promise that the Popol Vuh was well cared for and always available to future Kiche generations. I was told that the text needed to stay at the archive because it was under serious threat. There was the very real possibility that if it were to ever be returned to Guatemala, it could be destroyed by their government. So the, commu the Kiche community's request and the promise I made to them had, had tremendous impact on me. It, it showed me that every indigenous community is unique. Uh, what one community views as sovereignty can be quite different from another. And we have to respect these differences. We have to be open to the needs of each community. And um, there's just no one way to do this work. Yeah. You know, I think one of, before we leave the Southwest, I just want to spend one more question um, about, about Mexico itself, because that's your ancestral territory. And I think one aspect that really sticks in your craw, and we've been discussing this thing, at least in Canada, we've been hearing so much about the U.S.-Mexico border in the last four years with the wall, Mexico paying for a wall, et cetera, et cetera. It's really uh, in, in the U.S. political, Mexico political situation. I think that that's been such a critical part of the discourse. But what it does, it affects these borders, whether it's Canada, US or Mexico, US, these borders have really cut our communities in half, mm -hmm. you know, where we have relatives on both sides, but within Mexico, of course, it's a Spanish speaking country and the US and Canada are English speaking. So it's not only cut off your communities, but effectively it's cut off Mexico, the indigenous folks. And here in the North, we often talk about this notion of Turtle Island, yet Mexico is part of Turtle Island, but just because it's, it's Spanish speaking, right. it's also been effectively cut off discursively, right? right? So I'm just wondering, you know, this, the Mexican community is really being excluded from this kind of Northern discourse that we have. So I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about that. I have so many thoughts about this. <laughs> And this directly ties to decolonization. Um, decolonization is a big topic in museums, um, as you know, uh, right now. And I feel strongly that if we're truly going to decolonize, then we need to rethink and reframe the imposed settler colonial borders, including the US-Mexico border, according to indigenous perspectives and histories. We know that the imposed political and physical border between the US and Mexico was part of a national agenda to erase the political presence of sovereign indigenous communities at the border and further south. This had a lot to do with natural resources, specifically water. So when the water sources to the south were cut off or rerouted, 
the agricultural indigenous communities in what is now northern Mexico lost their farmlands. This is one main reason why we have an influx of migrant labor into the U.S. And in Mexico, there are over 60 indigenous communities. So to dismiss their sovereign identities only perpetuates the settler colonial mindset and, and violence, in my opinion. When I ask about uh, Mexican indigenous representation in academic context on panels or conferences or exhibitions, I'm regularly told that the reason we're left out of important conversations is because of language barriers. But I, you know, I just don't buy that anymore. With the technology we have today, language can no longer be an excuse for excluding our indigenous relatives to the South. Um, another connection is the uh, strong longitudinal connections between indigenous communities in the US, um, Mexico, and even further South. This becomes really obvious when we focus on the materiality and historical trajectory of indigenous art and art making practices. One very strong example would be the relationship between feather work and quill work, which share a deep aesthetic lineage. And here at the Met, we are talking about this and we're also addressing it through, through interdepartmental collaborations and projects that highlight these long-term material interconnections through the art. So that's a great segue now from, from that part of the world to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And uh, I'm quite excited to talk about this and as is everybody wanting to hear. So what's it like being the first indigenous curator at the Met? Well, it's very busy and <laughs> it's um, also very exciting and invigorating. You know, after years of working in museum leadership and administration, often behind the scenes, I, I just really wanted an opportunity to return to my fine arts roots. So I'm thrilled to be here and to be in New York, um, to be at this amazing institution. I work with a great team of people and, but you know, it's also a big responsibility, which I take very seriously. Working with indigenous art um, and community items takes great care. It's thoughtful, meaningful work that takes a lot of time. And there are cultural and legal complexities which I'm responsible for. So when I work, indigenous perspectives and the source communities are at the forefront of my mind. But the truth is I know no other way to work. My experiences as an indigenous woman working with indigenous communities, also my museum and archive work, and also my fine arts training have really helped me to prepare for this moment. Uh, I just want to stop, uh, not you for a second, but I just want to remind people out uh, that are listening, please uh, uh, send us your questions. We'll gather the, them at the end, but no doubt there'll be questions along the way. So please uh, feel free to uh, ask questions and then we'll gather them at the end. So let's continue with the questions. So why do you think it's taken so long to acknowledge the history and presence of indigenous visual traditions in the Americas uh, at the Met? Well, uh, you know, speaking from an in institutional um, perspective, the Met has had Native American art exhibitions. Uh, those exhibitions drew from two earlier collections um, than the Diker collection, the Rockefeller and Co. collections. However, when the Charles and Valerie Diker collection was gifted in 2018, as you know, there was much attention uh, this was partly due uh, to the fact that it was the first time in over 90 years that Indigenous art was exhibited in the Met's American wing, according to um, a strictly Western um, aesthetic context. And that's now, that narrative is shifting. Yeah, with such a huge staff at the Metropolitan, it's really nice to know that uh, you're not going to get lost because you not only have a collection, but an exhibition space to go with it to work with. So let's, let's just kind of focus on the collection for a few moments because uh, I'm familiar with the Charles and Valerie Diker collection because I worked on the collection a number of years ago. And it's really nice to see that the, this collection came to the Met because uh, uh, the Dikers could have given their collection to the National Museum of the American Indian because they were uh, for so many years on the board. Uh, so how will you be able to use not only the Diker collection, but the other collections to achieve some of your goals at the Met? Well, all three collections are, are quite strong. And the Diker collection really has provided a foundation to grow from. So I've been at the Met um, eight months, 
and already we're hosting programs, various events, and acquiring contemporary works relevant to the Diker Collection. Also, my American Wing colleagues and I have been developing exhibitions that respond to the, to the collection. And right, right now, we've been holding cur a curatorial convening that examines the challenges specific to working with Indigenous items. This convening has been going on for several months and is supported by the Terra Foundation for American Art. It's made up of several, um, a series of panels and discussions with curators and scholars in the field. So uh, curators like Heather Iglo Liorte, Jolene Rickard, Heather Atone, and many others have been joining us in really uh, thinking, um, doing some deep dives into this very complex work. So there's a lot going on that stems from the arrival of this collection and from the earlier work that many of my colleagues um, who served on the advisory committee um, many, much of their work when they helped open the 2018 exhibition. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about the Diker collection coming to the map is that they've also published a lot. They've, uh, uh, they've exhibited uh, their collection in various museums. As I said, I once uh, curated a show based on the collection. I also co-wrote an essay called Aesthetic in American Indian Art. Now I wish I could retitle uh, that. Uh, that essay, but uh, nonetheless, it's the essence that counts. But on the subject of aesthetics, um, you know, the Met, it's all about Western aesthetics. And uh, this series, in Indigenizing the Museum, the Art Museum, we want to bring an Indigenous perspective, uh, what I call an Indigenous visual knowledge. In other words, an Indigenous ways of seeing. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about that. I do. Um, so indigenous aesthetics, I, I think, um, as you know, are grounded in sovereignty, ecological, and intergenerational knowledge. And well, I, I think you say it really well in your essay um, when you write one parameter of native aesthetics is that the world is in a state of creation. And each person is part of that continual creation. I, I love that quote from your essay. So I understand my work at the Met as collaborative with indigenous communities and as continually becoming and growing, uh, much like your comment in your essay. So this involves ongoing communication and maintaining long-term relationships with source communities. It also involves being open to learning. So other important steps involve daily museum work, for instance, um, in-gallery didactics, new approaches to conservation that are respectful of indigenous protocols. Also, uh, our new in-gallery land and water statement makes very clear that we will be moving forward uh, working with these items according to indigenous perspectives and ways of experiencing the world. I'm often asked by people, so what's the difference between Western and indigenous aesthetics? And the best way for me to explain that is by tell, telling a story. Uh, so um, I'd like to share one that um, about a time when I returned to my great grandparents Pueblo um, outside Pazcuato. I think we have an image, right? Mm -hmm. So these are my great great grandparents. Uh, they're Pudapacha and Refugio and Maria Torres. And my, my great grandfather was a criado. He was a servant to an elite Mexican family. Um, and then my great grandmother was a curandera. She was um, a healer. Um, and my mother, uh, growing up, my mother shared many stories of my great grandmother's medicinal practices. So I went to their home community um, a while, just a while back. Um, can we have the next slide? Thank you. Uh, so when I was in Pazcuaro, I had the opportunity to visit um, the home of a Purepecha woman. Her name was Doña Francisca, and she invited me uh, to share a meal. She's going to cook a meal uh, for me. And in, in Pazcuaro, the kitchens are on the inside um, of a courtyard in the house. So the, the kitchens are it's their own separate building, and um, they're kind of a, a small shelter um, in the what would be like the yard of, of her home. Um, and as I was entering her home, walking through this kind of um, entryway, I noticed that there were a group of um, these brand new ovens. Uh, you can see them, like something we might see in our homes. 
and they were all shiny and brand new and wrapped in lots of cardboard and plastic. And there were like half a dozen dozen of them um, lined up along a wall. Uh, and so I was very curious about why uh, she had them there. So if we could go to the next slide. So after sharing a, a meal with Doña Francisca, and we also had a translator because she spoke Purapacha and I spoke English, um, you know, we shared a meal, we had some time together, it was, you know, all very welcoming, and we were very comfortable, and then I was invited to ask any questions that I wanted to, and so I asked about the, um, the row of uh, ovens outside and the packaging, and there was kind of this awkward moment where they both were looking around and a little bit uncomfortably. And I was then told that um, the brand new ovens or stoves that were lined up along the hallway were actually gifts from American tourists, um, specifically um, white American tourists who felt sorry for the Doña after they had visited her home because they saw she only had this clay oven to cook from. And so they would send her these brand new um, stoves and ovens. And the truth was she didn't want them. She never opened them. She left them in the hallway um, outside her kitchen. And um, what I was told was because the prop in, within uh, Pudapaja communities, the woman is, is the leader of the family, the eldest woman. The property all goes through her. And then um, she actually builds her own clay oven with her own hands and cooks from it for her family. She nourishes her family and it's considered an honor for her to do this. When she passes on, the eldest woman, uh, her family smashes the clay oven that she cooked from in order to release her spirit from this world. And then the next um, eldest woman then steps in and she builds her own clay oven and then she steps in to nourish and care for her family. So what's, what's interesting about that was just this beautiful, powerful story that reflected our differences in thinking. What other people viewed as her, um, as poverty was for the Doña and her family, um, the Parapacha people, um, her greatest source of wealth. Mm. Maybe she ought to do an installation and call it a, call it a work by Jeff Coons. <laughs> <laughs> With the, all the ovens lined up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh God, you arrived at the Met at the right time, you know, with the Dyker collection coming in and establishing its presence. And uh, with there was an exhibition called Native Perspectives that complemented the Dykers. Mm -hmm. uh, Kent Monkman's and Miss Tagosuk, which uh, re everything was kind of the stage was set for you. And so with the short time at, at the Met, surely you've seen lots of things going on even before, because you know all these curators, they want to introduce something new. But the outsiders, uh, you know, many outsiders often think these gigantic institutions like the Met move so sl ever so slowly. But I think curators really introduce things uh, that, that do advance the discourse much more. And I'm and I'm hoping you're doing the same thing. So have you been able to introduce something that you think will start to move the discussion a little um, forward a little bit? Yeah, I think we've been doing um, a lot of different things. Um, and one of something that I'm most proud of is uh, a part of our Art of Native America 2021 rotation. Uh, if we could have the next slide. We installed a new land and water statement. I prefer the word statement because this goes beyond the now standard momentary acknowledgement. Um, it's a type of in-gallery manifesto that clearly states how we will be moving forward working with, with uh, this art and being inclusive of indigenous voices and experiences. And I'd, I'd like to read a couple points from it, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go um, for it. Sure. So this is the new land and water statement that's now in, um, in gallery in Art of Native America 2021. We understand that these items, vibrant expressions of Native sovereignty, identity, and connections to community and family, embody intergenerational and environmental knowledge, including origin stories, languages, songs, dances, and ties to homelands. We commit to pursuing continuous collaborations with Indigenous communities 
and present Native American art in a manner that is inclusive of Indigenous perspectives, involves guidance from source communities, and creates space for respectful listening and thoughtful dialogue. We will work to advance Indigenous experiences in the Met's exhibitions, collections, and programs. Moreover, we will strengthen our awareness of the historical and contemporary environmental issues in the New York region and throughout North America in order to thoughtfully reckon with our institutional legacy and its impact on the lands, waters, and original peoples of this place. They are and always will be inextricable. So I just, I'm, I didn't think that they would let me put this in. I thought perhaps it was a little too strong. Um, and so I'm, I'm very happy that, that we can state clearly how, how we plan to move forward. Uh, maybe you can uh, talk us through a few more works from the collection and how you've dealt with it uh, in the context of the community, indigenous community, the art community. Um, yeah. Sure, we can go to the next slide. So um, this, these are two works that are now installed at the entrance of um, Art of Native America. They're created by Marie Watt, who is Seneca, and Jody Archambault, who is Hunkpapa and Oglala Lakota. Um, Marie's work what is, was created by um, community members working together to stitch together this giant blanket. And um, Jody Archambault's is a Northern traditional dance dress that was also created by her family and community members um, as a group. And so we selected these two pieces as the welcoming pieces that people would first um, encounter as they came into the gallery space because we wanted works um, by two strong Native women artists. We also wanted to create a space that was warm and welcoming and spoke to community connections. And also with the Marie Watt um, piece, it was very important to us to have a strong uh, native representation of the local communities. So having this Haudenosaunee work in this space was, was very important and, um, and respected the Haudenosaunee and other um, indigenous communities in the New York region as the host communities. So we're very excited about these two pieces. Um, it's hard to tell from these slides, but they're actually quite vibrant. They celebrate, um, you know, native culture and native vibrancy and community um, and we felt like with everything that everyone has been through this past year it was important to have something uplifting and so that's that's that was part of the goal for having these two pieces at the entrance yeah those are <clears throat> of course strongly contemporary we're, we're familiar with the work of marie watt uh, now i think the next slide is more more traditional right chitty matcha basket Yes. That you may want to talk about? Yes, these are two of my favorite uh, works in the show. Um, but one of the goals is to shift the narrative, um, the aesthetic narrative, to more of an indigenous um, uh, perspective, an indigenous um, aesthetic. And so one thing that we've been doing is to really do some deep dives in our labels in regard to the environmental and um, kinship ties to homelands that's embodied within the works. So these two, two Chirimaka baskets um, really demonstrate this quite clearly. So the basket on the left, um, well, actually both baskets were made by uh, Chirimaka artist Ada Vilkin Thomas and their 20th century works. The basket on the left um, or a trunk um, includes lots of references to land and water and also the process of Chirimaka community members gathering um, the materials to make the baskets, uh, the river cane to make the baskets seasonally. And then also the, the patterns are very distinct and reference um, ancestral and intergenerational knowledge. So the, the kind of the zigzag pattern across the top of the large trunk is called a worm track pattern. And then the large um, square-like patterns across the bottom of the trunk are muscadine rind um, patterns. And then on the smaller basket, um, you can also see the worm track pattern across the top. And then on the bottom, uh, there's kind of these swirling uh, designs that are referred to as 
alligator entrail um, designs. And so there's a lot of references to water in these baskets. And so they're just so striking. And another, another reason that I'm really in love with these works is that when we asked the dikers if we could borrow the smaller basket with the alligator entrails, um, I was digging through the Mets collections and saw that we have another Chitimaca basket in the Poe collection and realized they were made by the same artist. And we basically had sister baskets. And so I was very excited to be able to show both these baskets together, to bring them together, um, to have them in a space together so that they could speak to one another. You know, what's beautiful about that is that um, you're introducing an aesthetic from different parts of the country, uh, an indigenous, each one uh, separate from another. Um, so you can't just say it's a, one indigenous aesthetic, but there are several that's going on. And to see the Chitamacha basket makers really thinking about, about these ancient ideas that come out in the baskets. And I know there's several basket makers throughout the US and Canada uh, that, that think about the basketry, not so much as a basket as an object, but really as an idea. And uh, you know, there's some famous quote somewhere that a lady said that a, 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 a basket is a song that's made visual. You know, that, that really the basketry is about, is about, you know, that connection to the land, uh, the songs that are associated with the land, and that the relationship Indigenous peoples have with the land. And the basket is, you know, it's for use, yes, and museums get really excited when they see basketry. But for the Indigenous folks, it's really the continuity of the songs. And of course, a lot of those songs were erased from many of our cultures for so long, but it's so nice to see that coming back. And I think part of your project and part of what you're doing at the Met and other uh, indigenous curators are perhaps uh, not apologizing, you know, but actually, you know, without, without equating indigenous aesthetics with Western aesthetics, but just deal with indigenous aesthetics and not apologize for it because it's, an, it's a way of seeing that's been developed for thousands of years, you know, and we just need to think about that and not necessarily just return to it, but, but to establish the framework and the discussion so that, you know, at the Met, it can be discussed freely and, uh, and, and, and open. And I think that that was gonna be a, an interesting part of what your work is, but it's this indigenous perspectives, these native perspectives that I'm, kind of interested in because uh, there was a, a project that was complemented, as I said earlier, the Diker exhibition, in which uh, um, various indigenous folks were brought in, not necessarily responding to the Dikers, but responding to American art uh, in a specific gallery, if I understood it, in which they were asked to write labels, not about indigenous art, but about Western art looking at indigenous peoples. And uh, I recently was involved in a project that's gonna open this spring at our National Gallery here in, in Canada uh, in a Rembrandt exhibition where we were asked to write labels against Rembrandt. So I thought that was really exciting what you guys did to provide indigenous native perspectives of Western art. So with the release of your book, Water, Bones and Bombs, there's something interesting you wrote about George O'Keefe. You talked about it earlier. And I believe you also, and I remember you, you I think a few moments ago, you said you wrote a label, right? Yeah. And it's a very specific label about George O'Keefe. So maybe you can talk about that a bit further in the context of a native perspective, for example. Yes, I, you know, when, I, just exactly what you're saying, I think that there is, something that really opens up in the conversation when um, Indigenous people are invited to write about non-Indigenous art. There's a, there's a whole nother level of dialogue that emerges. And it's one that often takes um, non-Indigenous people by surprise. 
Um, and they are often like, I never knew that, or I never thought about that. And so that's, that's very exciting to see that happen. Recently, I was asked to um, freshen or rewrite a label uh, for this painting, um, Georgia O'Keeffe's Rancho's Church painting. And I wrote it from an indigenous perspective. I made sure to include in the label um, O'Keeffe's uh, connection to the Pueblo people and their influence, their architecture, which comes right up from the land, um, the concept of creating architecture that echoes the landscape, um, different hills or mountains, um, right up coming, emerging right up from the earth. And also their, their strong influence on her work, uh, their permanent influence on her work. And in the label, I write about how uh, her interaction with the indigenous people, specifically Pueblo people, changed her work forever. I think that without her connections to the um, indigenous people in Northern New Mexico, uh, she would not have had the success she had during the second half of her career. They were a great influence on her um, aesthetic at that time. Um, <clears throat> uh, that, that's so cool. I, li I really look forward to seeing that and maybe more of that can take place. <laughs> But now we get back to your, your space, your, your exhibition space. Now that you have an opportunity to present new exhibitions, you've got the Rockefeller collection, the Ralph T. Coe collection, and the Valerie and Charles Diker collection. But you know, um, it can quickly, what can quickly happen, I think people are sometimes concerned that Indigenous peoples get put on their reserve. You know, they get ghettoized. It's not a term that I like. And I think that there's opportunities for you to create a condition, a new condition, perhaps what some would say a condition of sovereignty, right? Mm -hmm. So would you agree with that, that you have that kind of opportunity and to move out of those that particular negative discourse? Yes, absolutely. And first, I want to say that I also dislike the term um, ghettoized. And um, I agree with you that that this is a moment where we can exercise sovereignty in terms of how we present the art. I think that it's critical that we have our own consistent gallery space um, within the museum one that presents our art according to our perspectives, a space where we are the hosts and we can invite non-Indigenous artists and artworks in as our guests um, when we choose to do so. And I think that you know that being a host comes from a place of generosity, but it also comes from a place of empowerment. So having a gallery space that follows Indigenous protocols, honors Indigenous experiences, and respects indigenous aesthetics, I think is absolutely necessary in, in a museum. I also think that having our own gallery can become a problem when indigenous art and artists are restricted to only one area of the museum and not included in other gallery spaces. It, it must be understood, however, that when, when we start um, engaging with those other spaces, when our art is exhibited in other spaces, it may not always be presented according to Indigenous perspectives. And I think that that's something um, you know, we need to think about. But one of my main goals is to support as many Indigenous artists and art scholars as I can. And I think that I'll begin to feel more satisfied about all of this um, when throughout many museum institutions, not just the Met, we have indigenous curators working in diverse departments, European paintings, sculpture, prints, drawings, photography, and no one blinks an eye and no one asks, oh, uh, you're indigenous, so why aren't you curating indigenous art? Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's time. Yeah, so how would you like to develop your future exhibition program? Well, I'll be presenting Native art along a historical through contemporary aesthetic continuum across settler borders and in mutual conversation with uh, non-Native art. And also right now we're exploring um, an idea for community-based exhibition. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, now let's, uh, I think we're coming in on the final slide, Kent Monkman, maybe we can shift to Kent. And of course, we're quite familiar here in Canada with the recently commissioned work of Kent at By the Met, his Mistagosawak, which means wood boat people, uh, was celebrated. And we know Kent has draw, draws heavily on Western paint, the Western painting tradition, but he always inserts an indigenous voice, right? Perhaps to create this symmetry of perspectives that you know, have long tilted towards a kind of a Euro-American tradition. So what can you say about that particular project that was commissioned and what does it mean for the future uh, of your program? Well, the Monkman Commission was part of an invitation for contemporary artists to create work that responds to the Mets collections. And my colleagues in the modern and contemporary department worked on this before my arrival. And the diptych was unveiled in our great hall in 2019. Um, Mr. Gosuak was a response to um, many artworks, iconic artworks in our collection, including Loitza's Washington Crossing the Delaware from 1851, and then also Eugene Delacroix's The Natchez um, painting from 1835, and also Thomas uh, Crawford's sculpture, Mexican Girl Dying from 1848. So these are 19th century works that depict the demise of indigenous peoples. And what I love about Monkman's work is that it visually addresses, th and this piece in particular, immigration issues and also settler colonialism. Uh, Monkman flips the narrative here in this very bold, um, beautiful way. He reverses the gaze, and it's Indigenous people who are empowered here, and mm -hmm. a strong Indigenous woman who's leading the way. Um, I think as Indigenous people, we're very familiar with, with this, that our women in our communities are, off, are quite often our leaders. Um, and then there's also this wonderful, um, of always dealing with some really traumatic and dark histories, there's also this wonderful sense of humor um, throughout his work. And I like to think of Miss Chief Eagle Testicle kicking the front door of the Met wide open with his <laughs> six inch high heels and letting all indigenous people in. Like, I, I feel like that's something that she would love to do. So I, I love these works. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> she, uh, Miss Chief has kicked many doors down, that's for sure, up here in Canada. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to use that quote somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but let me, let me uh, I'll quote another. Uh, uh, well, he's an Australian. I think he's kicked down a few doors, uh, which is kind of interesting because I, I just wanted to um, quote uh, Stephen Gilchrist, who was an Australian Aboriginal curator. For a few years, he, uh, for a number of years, he's come to the U.S., he, uh, and what's interesting about him is that two or three times he's been here, uh, at least twice, uh, he's told me that each time he's come, his wife has given birth to their child. So that's twice uh, that this Australian Aboriginal guy has given, you know, they've given birth to their children in the U.S. So they are, I guess, that makes them American citizen, Australian citizen, et cetera. So mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty cool. But anyhow. I'd like to, I, I wanted to quote Stephen, which I think uh, really goes to the heart of a number of the issues that we're talking about in this series. And I asked a curate, one of our other curators, one of my other guests, to respond to his quote when he says that colonization is not the meta narrative of indigeneity. And yet sometimes we can't avoid talking about this narrative. We can't, like, we're drawn into that Western narrative of colonization. Um, and so, you know, the Native Perspectives uh, project that was done at the Met kind of was, it's within that vein as well, but it's a, it's looking at it through Western art through an indigenous lens, which I, I kind of like. So I'm just wondering how you might, how your curatorial approach might counter this view, for example. Well, I, I like the Native Perspectives um, project and that'll be ongoing. We'll be introducing a new generation of, of um, indigenous voices to that project moving forward. But you know, the other part of that is I do have to say um, 
that I'm really not interested in presenting Native American or Indigenous art as interventions. I, I have a lot of mixed feelings about that. Mm -hmm. It's really important to center Indigenous perspectives and ways of experiencing the world rather than always um, speaking about art in context with colonization. Um, I think that the intervention approach um, is a tricky one, and it's one that uh, places the intellectual and aesthetic burden or labor further onto Indigenous peoples. And so I have some mixed feelings about that approach, but I think it's one that has great potential for growing, and we'll mm -hmm. see you know, what happens with it. Um, I do feel strongly that we can't always be um, you know, the people who exercise these interventions. I think that settler communities need to take responsibility for their own actions and histories and take the steps to make uh, important and very necessary changes. But that's going to take more than museum labels and it's going to take a long time. Yes, well, you're young for sure. <laughs> and you're gonna be doing it. So my final question is how do you expect uh, New York art world which is, uh, of course, very, very powerful internationally, and uh, the New York Art World community. And I'm hoping that uh, you, they might respond to this indigenous history, this indigenous presence at the museum. And I'm hoping it'll, it'll, they'll respond to it for years to come. What do you think about that? So too, I, you know, the indigenous presence here in New York is quite strong and New York, like many ma of our major cities, Chicago, Seattle, Mexico City, have always been indigenous metropolises. This, you know, this is due to the availability of natural resources in these spaces. Our major waterways, um, trading centers and markets were all originally established by indigenous peoples. And so, um, indigenous peoples have always been urban, uh, and all of our urban centers and cities have always been indigenous. We belong to these places, we belong to this uh, land, and we're here to stay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Patricia. I really, really enjoyed our conversation. Our hour, sadly, is up. I'm looking forward to coming to New York to see you, to see the exhibits, to see what's gonna happen. Things are gonna change, so I'm really excited. So thank you very much. Thank you, it'd be great um, to have you in New York. Thank you very much. I wanna also uh, reach out to uh, give a thanks to a number of our people. I'd like to uh, give a shout out to uh, Saida Akbari and Renzi Guaran from our IT who have been doing some really, really great uh, behind the scenes work for us. I'd like uh, finally to thank President Serrano, the Canada Council for their work in providing and underwriting this series. Uh, please join uh, me again next week this time when I'll be speaking with Kathleen Ash Milby, who is a curator of Native American art at the uh, Portland Art Museum. Um, and uh, so if the, any of you uh, are familiar with her, she spent as many years at the National Museum of the American Indian at the New York branch where, branch where she did some amazing work. And no doubt we'll be talking about her work from the National Museum of the American Indian days and to her new work at an art museum in Portland. So join us on any number of these sites, whether it's YouTube or Zoom or Eventbrite. I thank you very much. I bid you all a good day. Nanaskum. Bye-bye. <laughs>